So I'm a veterinary orthopedic surgeon, um, primarily doing surgery on um, small animals, meaning dogs and cats. Uh, but um, my areas of interest also include regenerative medicine treatments for cartilage defects, bone healing, and osteoarthritis. And so um, I was asked to uh, participate in this because I have some experience looking at use of biodegradable or bioabsorbable implants, and particularly moving toward treatments of OA and or joint replacement. So I'm going to go over a little bit of data um, that we generated a few years ago. This was done back at the, the University of Missouri when I was doing my doctoral degree in residency there at the time. And so one of the laboratory's major goals was to develop a methodology for biological joint replacement. So something that could overcome the limitations of current joint replacements using artificial materials, metals, plastics, and ceramics, um, in which we could ultimately end up with uh, functional bone and cartilage. And so one of the initial studies that was done um, through the laboratory and in conjunction with the laboratory at um, Columbia University in New York was replacement of the humeral head of a rabbit using polyepsilon caprolactone, which is a biodegradable polyester material. And I should also put out the disclaimer there right now, I am neither a chemical nor mechanical engineer, um, and so my expertise is limited um, accordingly. Um, but they performed the study in which they used CD, I'm sorry, um, computed tomography reconstructions of the native proximal humerus to create computer-assisted designs for individual specific implants, which they then ultimately um, infiltrated with um, a TGF beta um, delivered within a, a bovine collagen gel or scaffolds without such supplementation, placed those into rabbits, and then ultimately sacrificed them three months later, performed immunohistochemistry as well as histology. And what they found was that, particularly with the TGF beta-3 supplemented scaffolds, that they had very good integration um, into the bone and into the implant itself, so in terms of osseous regeneration. Um, and then also, very promisingly, uh, had high levels of type 2 collagen staining as well as for agrican, which can be seen in the two images there. So it appeared that they got both osseous and cartilaginous regeneration. So again, these results are encouraging, but the rabbit is a very forgiving model in terms of its regenerative capacity. And so one of the next steps was trying to identify a situation which this might be applicable to a person and then also a large animal model. So this is just one example of a uh, in which uh, hemiarthroplasty is performed in people, and that's individuals with um, deterioration of the humeral head and shoulder. So very similar to that rabbit model that we just showed you, but then there is also osteonecrosis or avascular necrosis of the femoral head um, in both dogs and in people. And so in looking to move this toward a large animal model, we looked at the canine and the canine hip specifically because dogs do get avascular necrosis of the femoral head, um, in which case the acetabulum can be normal. And the canine hip is the one situation or one joint that we very commonly do joint replacement. So there's a great deal of similarity between the dog and between the person. And so in trying to translate that study and what was um, achieved in the rabbit to the dog, we had several different areas that we needed to look at. And the first was design and mechanical testing of ephemeral resurfacing scaffold. Because of course the rabbit is much smaller and so mechanically speaking alone, again, a more forgiving model than a dog, which is going to apply more force. And so one of the big questions that remained is, well this can function in a rabbit, but will these constructs mechanically hold up to the loads that we would expect in either a dog and then ultimately a human being. Um, a second area, which I won't really go into detail, is development of a sur surgical technique or protocol to ultimately be able to test this. And then the third would be um, assessment of the biocompatibility of the construct in conjunction with canine either chondrocytes or mesenchymal stem cells. Um, and so for that first part is, can we make a scaffold that is sufficiently strong to withstand loading in the canine hip? And this was also a pertinent question because a, a lot of the work that had been done up until that point in time, looking at osseous regeneration, including in things like mandibular defects, had been, um, <clears throat> uh, had generated promising data, but uh, again, was not in a load-bearing joint um, or bone. And so basically the first thing uh, that we did was create some models for replacement of the femoral head and then ultimately place them into cadaveric um, canine femurs. In this situation, we actually cemented them in place with bone cement, um, potted the femurs, and then articulated them with a commercially available acetabular prosthesis and then loaded them to failure. 
And interestingly enough, what we found was that the load at failure was as high or higher with the implant than it was with the contralateral native canine femoral heads. And where we are seeing failure around 700 newtons was actually through the stress riser or hole created with potting of the femurs. So those data were really encouraging that at least from a mechanical standpoint, we could re um, create a construct that was sufficiently robust. Moving on to the separate area and looking at the biocompatibility, <clears throat> um, we had uh, greater problems. And uh, one of the things that I first tried to do was identify ways in which I could either get the canine, again, chondrocytes or, or ultimately stem cells to actually adhere and proliferate within the construct. Coming back to one of the major questions is, if you have a biodegradable material, how much ex vivo conditioning are you going to do with the um, cell source uh, of interest in order to optimize the mechanical and biological performance um, at the time of implantation? And what we found was that we were really getting poor adhesion and attachment, and it was also very much limited to the surface. So the image on the left-hand side of the screen shows some fluorescence suggestive or indicative of live cells adhered. But then when we looked or sectioned these constructs, there was really poor um, infiltration um, into the interior of the constructs. And <clears throat> so then tried to move toward biphasic constructs, which would involve culturing of cells within an agros layer that's then essentially bonded to the PCL. So hoping that the PCL would serve as the osseous regeneration, whereas the cells within the agros um, would serve as the chondral layer. But in performing this experiment, they stumbled um, upon a couple things, and that is um, that the manner in which we prepared and sterilized the PCL had significant ramifications for the cellular viability. And so this picture is of PCL constructs after they have been bonded to the agarose with cells, um, as well as some agarose constructs containing the cells, uh, which are actually sitting in the wells that appear pink. And so what we had actually done was a resusurin assay to assess cellular viability, and what we happened to find was that there is a very obvious and gross distinction that any of the constructs, or any of the wells, sorry, that actually had the polyepsilon caprolactone within them had no viable cells. And so we followed that up with a more controlled study where we had several different groups using some sterilization methods such as isopropyl alcohol and UV light, which are used sometimes um, prior to doing live animal studies, but which ultimately would not be adequate before putting anything into a person, and then compared them to hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, which we had used, um, plus that and a subsequent wash of the constructs. And then follow that with, again, the same register and assay and subjective cellular viability. And what we found is um, of those four groups, this image alone very much demonstrates what we found, and that is very, very poor cellular viability um, for the group uh, shown in the upper left-hand corner, which is the group that was sterilized with the hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. There was moderate cellular viability for the group on the right in which hydrogen peroxide gas plasma had been used followed by a wash, and then good cellular viability when it had not, and just UV light or isopropyl alcohol disinfection had perf been performed. And those results were statistically significant. And so that's kind of really a, a very small s snapshot and brings me to just touch upon or mention some of the things that I think are pertinent regarding the combination of the biodegradable materials and stem cells. And that is that, number one, I think osseous regeneration using polyepsilon caprolactone is feasible. Um, and certainly other investigators and labs have demonstrated this um, um, to an even greater extent than we have. But ultimately, if we're looking for osteochondral resurfacing, the bigger challenge is going to be the regeneration of the cartilage, not surprisingly. And we probably need to be capable of developing constructs that are either biphasic or triphasic um, so that they facilitate the regeneration of the distinct layers of a joint. Um, and, then and then associated questions are what then would be the ideal cell source to use in conjunction with such materials? And what is the ideal ex vivo preconditioning protocol um, to maximize the mechanical as well as biological performance prior to implantation? So I'll leave it with that, and uh, I'll take any questions at this point, or we can wait till the end. Thank you, Sam. Questions? Well, I, what do you guys think about it? Actually, I do have a couple. Um, this is very, very interesting, by the way, and uh, I'm sure there's a huge market and need for that. So uh, the question is, 
I, I obviously I'm interested because we kind of use polymers as well. So I guess I'm trying to learn. Um, PCL, we'll see a sort of absorption time because I would think that you will choose actually a non absorbable material for, for, for the hip. So I'm really. It's very slow. So PCL is one of the longer lasting um, polyester. So it would take, oh, at least six months before deterioration in vivo. So in fact, a, a lot of the groups, my understanding is that have looked at using PCL in vivo have actually wanted to hasten the reabsorption or degradation of the material over time, and then have done other modifications such as um, incubating with things like sodium hydroxide prior to implantation so that they have actually initiated the degradation. And in that case, they break down more rapidly. Okay, well that means then um, you had uh, obvious regeneration of the uh, ulcers uh, component, so it'd be, oh, well, that's great. Um, and the other question was, your sterilization method, uh, you had one with plasma and uh, peroxide and plasma that didn't work. Um, is, is it maybe it's got anything to do with uh, hydrophilicity or hydrophobicity of the PCL? Is that Maybe, are you etching with the plasma, you think, or what do you think is happening there? Um, so what I think is happening is that, and, and we followed this up with a couple more experiments, um, and so what we think is happening and, and found was that, number one, we think that there was residual hydrogen peroxide within the interstices of the constructs um, in that initial, or in those initial experiments, in which we would perform the sterilization the day before we actually moved them to in vitro culturing. And then what we did is we followed up looking at <clears throat> what would happen if we did, if we used hydrogen peroxide, but then followed with either washing um, or aeration over a period essentially of four to six weeks, in which case there was still um, greater toxicity to the cells in comparison to, for example, the UV light or alcohol controls, but the washing or the aeration did mitigate that to a degree. Uh, ultimately, I think that if one is looking to um, use these, or when we get to the point in the future where they are potentially usable in the future for people, gamma or radiation um, probably provides a less toxic um, uh, methodology. But the disadvantages of gamma radiation are its expense and availability. So in initial studies in animal models, it would be um, more cost feasible if we can use um, a gas-associated sterilization protocol. Thank you. We are actually using gamma, and uh, yes, you are correct. It's pretty expensive, but you know my CEO is paying for it, so but it's all good. All right. A, a quick question on the mechanic problems. I may have missed it. How did whether the single or the biphasic scaffold? How did that compare to the you know the stiffness of native bone or cartilage? Yeah. So. I, I can't remember exactly um, the Young's modulus that we quantified, um, but we did that both, um, well, uh, when we quantified it using um, cylindrical disks, the constructs that we were making were similar to the cancellous bone. So not as stiff as mature cortical bone, um, but certainly on the order of what one might expect in the region of the femoral head, in which the majority of the bone really is a relatively dense cellus bone as opposed to cortical. Yeah, I was just wondering because the, that, that uh, caprolactone is kind of a, more of a rubbery polymer versus, versus like a glycolic or a lactic acid. Right. And my, my limited understanding is that the molecular weight of the PCL that one uses influences it as well. And so we were using, in these, we were using um, the 15,000 molecular weight, which was actually the issue that we were running into is it seemed to be more brittle. And so we were really concerned that it was going to fracture. And so when we were doing um, the quantification of the modulus of them using just the disks um, and typical load cell, we were essentially getting fracture at the point of failure. And so we were concerned that everything later was going to be pointless. But what, what we wanted to do, or part of the motivation for actually creating then the femoral head and articulating it with the acetabulum was seeing whether if that distribution of load was more representative of what we might expect in the joint and, and spread out over a larger surface area, would the performance be adequate? And in that scenario, we found that it appeared at least feasibly adequate. I found that with the uh, gamma radiation, it's changed some of the qualities, the physical qualities of the carriers for the cells that I've tried, and, and made them more brittle. 
Right. And so it, when you try gamma radiation, I would suggest maybe redoing right. the Young's modulus to see if that has yep. had an effect. Absolutely. And I, I think I've read that somewhere else as well where they've quantified that. So, uh, I mean, ultimately, I think the point is wherever we, you, we move in terms of prior to actually putting it in the animal models, any subsequent steps of testing, we really need to validate what the exact protocol we're going to use because everything that we do is going to influence either the biological or mechanical characteristics of um, the combination. We, we did uh, FTR and uh, XPS after gamma and the surface chemistry uh, changes. So it's like, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So you could have told me that earlier, okay, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I was just wondering if you had any proteins, or did you coat the, the PCL before you actually put the cells on or anything like that, or did you have FBS in your media, or just we one did, of your we did, we, did, we did have FBS. Okay. Um, but we didn't do anything special in terms of uh, treatment of the surface um, in order to try and enhance that. The only other thing that I tried to do was develop a methodology for actually delivering the cells to the interior of the construct, um, but that failed, which is when I then moved to the agarose. And I guess I, I should follow up and mention that bonding the agarose to the PCL did not work. Um, and I tried repeatedly, didn't work, and then we had collaborators who tried and actually wanted us to go to in vivo study, which we did, and it didn't work. And then I spoke with a chemical engineer who I now work with the University of Georgia who told me you know, similar, you know, up front that there's no way the agros will ever bind to the PCL. So even though um, it tends to work well ex vivo in terms of um, culture in the cells, I don't think that ultimately in the long run that's going to be the material of choice. I think that there's going to have to be another combination to serve as the as the chondral layer, and um, I think that other groups um, have already um, been able to combine the macroporous constructs for the osseous portion, similar to what we described in conjunction with um, microfiber or electrospun woven for the cartilage layers. I know Jimmy Cook, you know, and he's a tremendous probably a guide for you. At, you know, the University of he, Missouri. He, he's my mentor. He's mentor. Yeah, so he's, he this should is, be a mentor. he's a good guy. Yeah. I remember one time, and I don't know how far he got on this project, but he was um, using agarose with titanium, and it was used as a, almost like a vibrational antenna on the edge of an osteochondral type of a construct. Yes. Did you get a chance to evaluate any of that type work um, in your um, Yeah, so that, that preceded what what we talked about here. So they were they used that and ultimately made it as far as um, an in vivo resurfacing of the patella in dogs. And they used um, different combinations. So they used the tantalum metal in conjunction with the agarose. Um, they used uh, cortico, um, sorry, cancellus allograft bone for the bone layer bonded with the agarose. And in all of them, in terms of that patella resurfacing, I would say that the results were fair at best. Um, and so it was part of the motivation for moving this direction toward the PCL was based upon the success of the rabbit study. I will go so far as to say that that laboratory has moved um, very much in the direction of osteochondral allografting um, because they have had um, more rapid and greater success in improving um, allograft preservation uh, such that use of allografts now is, is feasible for them to do not only focal defects in people, but they're even doing large and almost total joint replacement with osteochondral allografting now. Who's doing that? Yeah. Um, l large joint osteochondral allograft replacement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the University of Missouri's. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah, um, I, I would suspect that Dr. Bugsby and other at UCSD in San Diego, you know, have obviously been doing a lot of osteochondral allografting for a long time, and they will, they're probably doing a l large regional replacements too at this point. Well, it's, it's not really a question, it's more an answer uh, to your last two questions. Uh, for the, uh, what's the ideal cell type and the uh, ideal uh, pretreatment? Uh, and in fact, it depends what you want to do. Because if, you, if the target is doing an engineered construct, well, 
a DSL type with some SEs and uh, uh, pre-treatment is mechanical loading, uh, uh, an hour a day, 10 cycle, 10 hertz, one hertz. Uh, but if you want to go clinical, uh, the answer is no pretreatment and no cells. Uh, and, and that's more the challenge in uh, designing the, the a scaffold that could work in those conditions. Right, yeah, it, it's a balance, right? If we could do all clinical repairs um, that are one step and don't involve multiple surgeries and ex vivo preconditioning, not, that would be easier and faster. Um, but there are few of those that meet our goals at this point in time from a bio you know, with a biological approach. So um, I'm sorry if I missed this and you may have spoken to it, but have you, are you doing work in the acetabulum? I mean, can you talk to that a little bit of what, what if anything, you think has the best shot of working in sort of um, uh, reshaping, if you will, the acetabulum or a portion of the acetabulum? I, I don't. Um, because most of the time when hemi, my understanding is most of the time when hemiarthroplasty is done, we're looking more at the femoral head replacement rather than acetabular while maintaining the femoral head. And so the femoral head osteochondrialograph replacements that they've done at Missouri in the last year um, have been that. They have been femoral head replacements rather than acetabular. But um, theoretically, is there any reason why this mat these materials in your mind, like, if they didn't work, I mean, sorry, if they did work on the femoral head side, could not work on the acetabular side with sort of like a reverse molding? Um, no, but I don't know of anybody who's used these materials in vivo for the femoral head yeah. replacement in a large animal model yet. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you very much. I. Um, my name is Tim Ganey, and I'm Chief Scientific Officer for Vivex Biomedical. I'm also the Director of Orthopedic Research at the Atlanta Medical Center. And I'm going to speak today on a couple of different topics. I'm going to look at a little bit of um, orthopedic application. But I want to um, share with you a couple of different ideas. We're going to look at a little bit of composition, and I think Sam has done a great job of giving us some idea of composition and change and integration, how that might affect. I'm going to speak about something a little bit different. Um, I was kind of going through some books the other day and packing as I'm back and forth between Atlanta and Tampa. And I was looking at Jacob Bernowski, where he talked about the new magic in science, and it's the magic of technology. Well, I'm going to share with you two different technologies today that you may not have seen, and to me, these are very unique. There's been an evolution of materials, certainly, you know, both in form and function and composition. I think Sam spoke to the polycaprolactone, the ability to mold or to guide or to build, as you might suspect. And I think at one point we tried to imitate but then it's materials that change. And certainly we can change materials with coating. We can take peak, or we can take hydroxyapatite. And by putting these on the materials, we're able to affect the change. We change the binding, we change the apposition, we change the mechanics of the cells themselves. We can also change the chemistry of the materials as well. And you can go from a peak to a pec, and all of a sudden from going to a ketone, from an aldehyde, you have a different complete set of molecules. For a long time, we've looked at these ball and stick models. And I think as we develop these compositions, we're able to look at something completely different. Whereas you may look for serotonin for feeling good or having these insights or preventing your aging, you also now are able to change the surface chemistry on these materials and create isoelectric sheets that will actually function as receptors or reporters or ways to actually go in and interrogate the materials themselves. There are many people also working with this isomorphic chemical topography where you begin to use the electric fields of the molecular surfaces and in doing so you actually create the surface for the binding and you guide the direction of the cells and their activity. We've known for a long time that these functions will change cell activity. This is kind of an old work that was done, oh gosh, 10, 12 years ago. But what you find is, and if you look carefully, I don't know that I have a, um, wait, there's a, there it is, okay. So if you look at this here, what you find is when you reduce or you constrict the flow, you turn these all into cigars. And these aren't going to behave like endothelial cells anymore. And as soon as you relieve this pressure, they go out and flatten out. So you're able to restore it just by changing some of the functional dynamics. You get rid of some of that chaos flow, that turbulence, and you go back to a laminar flow, and they go right back to normal. I want to give you just a little model for the way I'm thinking about this, and I call it kind of a linear development. So if you look at each of these brackets, and you consider each of these a circumstance, so it could be temperature, and it can be flavor, or it can be color, or it can be size or restrictions, 
then every cell has its way in the dynamic, and if the arrows affect time, then each of as they move through these becomes something different, and it shows you how they develop. If you look at it like this, and you don't change any of the parameters of the culture, it's like a tissue culture, and they just go right through their cycle. So those orange balls representing a cell early, later, and then in its terminus. And if you then change one variable, you have the ability then to also distort that cell line or cell that tissue, kind of like your morphology, your isomorphic development. And you can do the same thing with this. But what I'm going to suggest to you, there are many other ways to do this. And by combining a couple of different variables, you can actually extend and interface what you want to see, how you want to see it, and where you want it to occur. And I think that's the value what we're going to see in a lot of the regenerative medicine. So you can change this you still get to the same endpoint with a larger size, but you can take it through a couple of different functions to get it there. So I'm going to speak to two particular types of material modifications. I'm going to talk about a kinetic response and a mimetic response. I'm going to do the kinetic first. And Tracy and I had a friend named um, Jesse Hunt, and he, he came to us and he showed us this tissue. And he says, what do you think of this? I said, well, that's fantastic. It's making a ton of bone. And we look at this cage. He says, well, how does it work? And I said, well, you know, that's a good question. Let's figure this out. So you, you look at the lamellar bone, you see the fact that you've got really nice reversal lines, but it's a truss. So he's building it as a truss, and you go to the mechanical engineers, and you say, well, how does this work? And so you have both compression and tension at the same time on these materials. And in doing so, as we know, bone is very much responsive to mechanical forces. You should be able to predict and make them change to build the bone you want. We're not the first people to recognize this. High frequency mechanical transduction has been shown for a long time. I kind of grew up in a time when Webb G was still at Utah, and um, Carol Woodard was at the University of Florida Vet School. And so in working with him, he says, you know, if you listen to Harold Frost a little bit, you'll realize that microstain in and of itself is the way to make it happen. And Frost had this mechanostat function, where you look at the amount of altered state, you look at the microstrain over time, and you're able to predict whether you have a bone at rest or you have a bone in gain. So we looked at this truss system here. We cut out a piece of the truss. And would you find that if you take this out and you think about the osteoblasts on here, an osteoblast is 20 to 30 microns, and you think of the length of a truss, maybe 10 millimeters, but you only need to move 37 nanometers in strain to affect the change that Frost was predicting. So what we did is we looked at this as a way of maybe becoming a mechanical generator. So we find that you have a calcium influx, you have a BMP elution, and you're able to make bone. And it should be appropriate to the radius of the strut. So we've been able to demonstrate this, that you can either have a static titanium or you can have an active mechanical strut and stretch it. And in doing that change, you were able to transduce actually the genome of the osteoblast and make more bone. So the surface matter, here at Georgia Tech, there's been a lot of papers on the titan spine. And they're able to show you if you have an endoskeleton, if you have an etched surface, you're actually able to change. When we looked at the full web truss, if we looked at the kinetics in addition to being able to move, and what you find in that roughness is if you characterize it, it's rough all the way along. But if you think about it in terms of the variations between the roughness, you realize that the closer the roughness are together, the higher the ramp and the more the amplitude, so you get more transduction of the material itself. We build a model to, to look at this and how it's going to change. And you look at the disparity ratio, or the height difference in the roughness versus the crevice. And what you find is that the closer they become together, if you keep the roughness the same, the more you amplify the response. You create peak forces. So where you may only get 180 or 200 uh, micro strain, you're able to get 12 times that effect when the crevices get close. Also, if you change the height, you get a similar type of an amplification. So let's go back to this one more time, thrust mechanostat, and look at bone loss or bone gain. If you put this in a biochamber, and you actually measure CT in real time, you can actually make a measurement of the movement of the truss itself, thereby knowing how far the bone moved as well. When you measure this, you find that stain is proportional to load, and it's inversely proportional to the strut diameter. And so offsetting the magnitude of strut diameter, and these are all 3D printed, you can actually tailor your truss to the patient, knowing its weight, size, gait, and length. So, this is the piece of translation that I'm going to carry into the next piece. So knowing that you have mechanical, what is going to be the next step? In this case, we know roughness. We know amplification. We also know that the cells attach themselves to the point of strain, and we know that bone models to reduce that strain. 
we've been able to demonstrate collagen expression that's 400% over normal BMP2 expression, which is considerably above normal, and bone without a cartilage intermediate. So I want you to carry these pieces into the next part of this talk. And this is the mimetic space, and this is something I'm doing a lot of. This is actually my impetus right now, my emphasis probably in what I'm doing. But you look at buoyancy and microgravity, and how do those two compare? When you think of buoyancy, you think of the ability for um, our terrestrial mammals. You look at whales, and I spent four years at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Florida, and there we did a lot of marine mammal stranding. So I was dissecting dolphins and whales and seals and several other things as well. But what you find when you look at that bone is if you look on the left, you see that human cancellus bone and it has an isotrophic type of a signature, which means it's loaded to history. You see it, um, why it's loaded at the same each time. It's responsive to gravity. When you look at the whale cancellus bone, you have greater surface area, but it looks more like the microgravity that our astronauts experience when they leave the planet. And one of the things that's very different between astronauts and whales is whales have parathyroid atresia, as kind of as a veterinarian would tell us as well. And in doing so, they model by tension. So what we've tried to do is to establish our um, isotrophic type of a distribution where you can look at this field anyway. So if you look at it this way, or you look at this way, or you look at it out of field, you're able to find you get the same surface area, the same dynamics, the same loading, same remodeling history. So I kind of grew up in a blue collar way, and my dad always kind of told us about laying bricks. You, you know, once you get this thing started, you're on your way. You get that first course down, you make it happen. So this was a, uh, resulted in a collaboration that was developed with Aerospace Corporation and Vivex Biomedical here in Atlanta, Georgia. We've been able to work with Dr. Frank Livingston. Frank is probably the, um, the ultimate laser specialist in the world. There are four of these labs throughout the planet and he has built them all. He um, is able to actually materially change the composition of plastics, metals, and bones without actually affecting the chemical substructure. So I went out there speaking with Frank, and I said, what we want to do is we want to create like a, an isomorphic topology. We want to get back to that brick pattern. We want to be able to kind of lay it down both in geometry and depth. And right now we're kind of limited to something like, like a dado on your saw or something like a router. And so Frank says, well, what I can do is, is, is I can bring together micro CT data. I can give you width, depth, geometry, and I can do it in one pass of the laser. So this is what it looks like when Frank is um, cutting the laser with us. He's getting seven, seven femtosecond resolution on laser. And Frank is clever enough to send two lasers behind each other. The first one is doing, creating a fluency. I'm not really going into the physics, but he creates a fluency where it's a near melt, almost like you have something that's almost a soft. He follows it with the second laser, and you know how you can amper trough in the same phase. He takes it out of phase and freezes it. So what Frank did for us was he froze this material, influency, and he created a bioresonant implant. So not only did we get the geometry and the depth and the topology, he also made it electrically conductive. So all of a sudden, instead of having a material that's an insulator, we have a material that's an active conductor. And as many of the people know in this room, when you look at stem cells and you look at their ability to differentiate, the more you're able to hyperpolarize, the more they go towards a bone phenotype, the less they fibrose, the less they differentiate. So we have something we thought was pretty interesting. When you look at the electron microscopy on this, we also try to get the same order and structure here as you would get in, um, in a laminar type of bone. In effect, at the same magnification, you get the same collagen birefringence and same diameters. We, we build it to have that same resolution. As a, as a construct, also surface area is very critical to bone formation. When you look at the sides of these cuts and you look at the top left, that's your standard peak. That's coming out of a milling machine. And people like Tracy Anderson in the building are experts at that machining. They know how to make peak. They know how to machine it. They know how to represent that. What Frank was able to do is create this kind of a orange peel looking material. And what's unique about that, or if you think of kind of your basic geometry of four pi r squared being a sphere or the surface of a sphere, you look at these hemispheres, so they're two pi r squared. So in an effort to create this electrically conductive biogeometry, he also created twice the surface area in every sweep. So we doubled the surface area, modeled an isotropic distribution, and made it electrically conductive in one pass. Um, some work that Wendy Weston has done, we were able to actually look at these cells. How do they behave on this? I mean, it's great to have a beautiful piece, and it's a nice art piece, but where does it work? So we tested these on normal um, um, stem cells, we look for their ability to differentiate towards bone. We challenged them at 10 days with an Alcyon Blue to look at the um, 
uh, alkaline phosphatase, and we also followed them out with alizarin staining to look at the calcium staining at 20 days. As you can see on the left, this is our control. This is a standard peak materials, untouched, unblemished. On the right panel, you begin to see what happens to that material when you offer an electric conductivity. At 10 days, we begin to see complete crossing, complete closure across the surface. By 20 days in stem cell culture, we begin to demonstrate that matrix with bone in it. And by 30 days, we had a very collected matrix where you, I don't know if you can see it at this, but um, these magnifications begin to see the monocyte type phenotypes that are characteristic of bone with the prominent nucleoli. We looked at it with the electron microscope as well. And what you find is that you find that the bone attached to that electrically conductive surface preferentially over the peak material. In fact, we had five times the matrix within the geome geometric phase as we did on outside on the peak. Um, at Vivex, our intention is to certainly bring these into the uh, clinical applications as quickly as possible. The FDA requires that you do a particle analysis to be sure, be sure that you don't shear materials or create something that's very brittle or something that's going to be compromise the patient with a lot of um, accelerated uh, inflammatory responses. The FDA requires that you do 4 milligram in rabbits and 56 milligrams and you be under this before you go into a clinical trial. As you can see in this slide, at 600 newtons or 150 pounds, maybe loading an 800, about 170 pounds, what you find is that we're under a milligram in total at 5 million cycles of testing on this material. So we have something, again, let me just to kind of bring these remarks together. We have something that's uh, geometrically isotropic, electrically conductive, and at the same time, it's stable. Stable's great, it looks good you know, in the lab. What does it do in proof of concept? We want to be sure that we have a stable fixation, we have a, a mobile restriction, and that we're able to get an efficient fusion. We did a large animal model at the University of Florida. Pat Callahan was our surgeon down there. And we did the 12 of the bioresonant implants and matched that with eight of the standard peak. We looked for them either alone or with graft, and then we contrasted them out at six months. And again, the goal, let me go over this one more time. You, you think of it within this room, we all have a little bit different size, we have a little bit different gait. And the idea is to use this peak implant to create this area of the surface here that allows the early bone cells to settle on those. And then the vertebral bodies from each and of us that are individuals will then create this zone of compliance. And the idea is to accentuate that modeling, that compliance zone right down to the implant itself. So at three months, we were, we were rather astounded. I remember kind of sending this to Tracy, and he goes, holy cow, that is great. But you find the complete isthmus of bone that formed between the two vertebral bodies. And this is with no grafting material. And when you think of the standard of care, particularly in the United States, you have an allograft plus a spacer of peak. And so we were doing this with nothing. When we compared this at three months with our standard graft and a peak implant, we found we had the typical autolysis. We didn't get the tight fit. So one of the things that really we wanted to look at is say, well, are we getting a formation? You know, it may be great to just quiet the fibrosis, but is it actually giving us bone? So we look at the projected surface of the wireframe. This is what the laser saw as it was going down. This is actually the CAD of the geometry of the cancellous bone that we wanted to put. When you superimpose this over the sheep's spine, I think it's pretty clear. You look at this um, posterior column and you look at the trabecular structure. It's very wide, very open, very lacy. This was the web based in size that was placed into the um, vertebral body. We, what we found here was that the bone that formed immediately adjacent in a micro CT in a serial section was exactly the same as the implant. So we were actually able to resonate the design with the bone that formed behind it. We did histology in this, of course, maybe get a better look at that. Um, the mimetic with no graft on your left, the mimetic with the graft on the right, seemed to be a bit of an impediment just by having the thing full and actually slowed at three months, which resolved itself. But when you look at the histology, and on the left you're going to find the plain, non-etched material. On the right, you're seeing our mimetic material. You cannot even see the bone forming because of the fibrous sheath around the material on the left. And that's standard of care with graft, with peak, at three months. By six months, we had complete consolidation of our grafts that had the peak on them. Uh, the standard with the graft, we had good apposition. I would say it was a tight fusion, but you still had a lot of fibrosis around the graft. You had gone around it, but you still didn't penetrate kind of that inner space around the graft itself. And you look at the standard mimetic at the six months, well-modeled, nice lamellar bone, 
Again, you cannot see the peak implant within this frame relative to the same size, same magnification compared to the mimetic with the peak. So in summary, we have a summary of a six month histology. We have extensive bone contact. We have very little evidence of fibrous tissue interface. We had a highly cellular, very healthy bone that was formed adjacent to the implant. We've taken this technology and also done it on bone. We were able to do this on allograft, actually machine bone with lasers to create new types of materials. And I was thinking in terms of your interest in um, uh, looking at allografts or being able to, to maybe use these into a, a canine population. What we were able to do in the same way Frank did with the fluency of the plastic materials, he actually took this and also he can do the same fluency within bone. So you were able to um, acknowledge not only the inorganic appetite, but you were also able to shrink that collagen around it. And so when you look at this, you see these almost like little cauliflower heads of very tight um, um, inorganic type of a calcium hydroxyapatite. The thing that we gained on this too, I think is really important, and I've heard a couple questions. Let me go back to, to something maybe I could have said a minute ago. We did x-ray dispersive spectroscopy. We looked at uh, x-ray microanalysis. We did compositional analysis with electron dispersive spectroscopy as well. And what we found, there was no change in composition. It was exactly the same. What Frank had actually done was just flip all the carbons so they, they all looked up as we had. Kind of like you see the leaves on a rainy day right before it rains, you see them all turn silver because they're all up. Frank had turned all the carbon sides of the peak materials up. So going back to kind of this principle of tiers and course and foundation, uh, we had asked Frank, as I think many in this room will know, you need about a three to one um, orientation of a, a of a flat place over the grooves to actually make bone grow the best. That's the type of surface that it likes. And so Frank was able to achieve this same three to one. So if you go back to that magnified piece, you realize he created this surface within the context of a three to one. So in any of the slopes that we've done in bone, we have macro material changes and we have micro material changes as well. So again, this activity, we're looking at adaptation, advancement, extension, and translation. Um, I go back to maybe a, a closing piece here um, from Sir Francis Bacon, which was you know, many years ago. He talked about knowledge being power. But I think maybe it's more important that we cannot command nature except by obeying her. And I think that's the same thing that Bernowski was talking about. He was basically talking the difference between black magic and white magic. You don't want to swim upstream your whole life. You want to go with the flow. You want to accentuate. You want to integrate those things as best you can. So in this context, I think of cell-based therapies and the World Summit that we've been allowed to participate in here, I think being able to change those materials, being able to change the interface and change the reaction are things that are still within our hands. And I, um, I thank you and acknowledge much help today uh, from Tracy Anderson at Vivex, who's the CEO and founder, Wendy West, who did the cell work, David King, who's done the IP, Frank Livingston, Tim Taylor, who set up the aerospace collaboration, Jason Caffey, Bob Saab, Matt Bigley, and Jesse Hunter for who loaned me some slides. So thank you very much. So we were actually, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it will be quick. Uh, uh, we were just actually asked to uh, present some, some of the data. We, we, we announced some, uh, what we believe is sort of groundbreaking uh, data from our large animal study. Uh, and uh, the only, and I guess it's okay because we only have a few minutes left. Uh, most likely I won't be able to answer all the questions if there are any because we still haven't uh, uh, analyzed all the data and uh, now I work for a company and being a publicly traded company unless we tell the entire world I, I won't be able to get into details unless we're ready okay. so uh, I guess I can get started in the meantime. So, uh, so I'm the Chief Medical Officer of uh, um, Harvard Apparatus Regenerative Technology. We are uh, regenerative medicine or biotech. It all depends how you look at it, and uh, it all depends on what you think. It's, uh, if, it's, if you believe in regenerative medicine, I guess that's what we do. So we bioengineered implants that we surgically implant and this scope is to uh, restore the structure and the function of organs. We are focused on hollow organs, namely the esophagus and the, uh, the airways, which include the trachea and the main bronchi. 
Um, I guess now would be a good moment to see if I can keep going, because I, uh, I sort of wanted to frame our technology a little bit. So we're addressing a whole spectrum of diseases that affect the esophagus and the airways. Of course, you think cancer, and cancer is for sure the uh, majority, but we're also addressing trauma, infections, congenital abnormalities. Think of uh, esophageal atresia that affects one in 4,000 uh, births in the United States, which means that the, uh, when, you, when you hear atresia, that means that that organ, mm -hmm. that tissue hasn't developed fully. So in the, in the case of the uh, esophageal atresia, the esophagus, which is a tube, hasn't developed fully and is, is like interrupted. It can be like an hourglass shape or it can be completely interrupted. And uh, this can be fatal. And there are ways right now to try to put the, uh, uh, the to pull on the esophagus and try to make it grow. So, again, cancer of the esophagus. Cancer of the esophagus. Cancer of the, uh, of the lung. When you think about cancer of the lung, we all think about the lung, but actually cancer affects the bronchial tree. And a good portion, actually 40,000 cases of lung cancer are located really not in the periphery of the lung, as again, probably sometimes we, we think of, but the cancer is located in the main bronchi. So, you will think, okay, well, let's cut it out. And that's what we do. We just, uh, you know, we're glorified butchers. So what we do, we cut it out. Well, there's one problem. Then, then as you probably heard, when you resect any cancer, you don't just resect the cancer. You gotta sort of go a little bit there and a little bit there, because we wanna make sure there is no one single cells that it, you couldn't see the single cells, but it was there because that cell is gonna wake up at some point and it's gonna haunt you. So you have bottom line, you have to cut a larger piece. And when you cut a larger piece, well sometimes you are left with nothing and you gotta get the lung and everybody gives me a hard time but that's what we do in the OR and I apologize for being, for being crude. We literally throw a healthy lung in a bucket because we can't reattach it. There's nothing with the, so I'm not gonna elaborate on what your life is gonna be without one lung because we almost, becomes almost a common sense. So I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna waste any time. We also address the trachea. Uh, the cancer is rare, trauma not quite so much. And the trachea is really something that when you resect it, you know, the surgeons can be as creative and as, and as but we just can't put it back together. Imagine of a pipe and you, you know, you, if you cut a little piece, you can probably put it back together. If you, if you have a large piece, you just can't put it back together. And somehow it's like you need another piece of pipe. And that's, I guess, what we do, even though we don't really do that. We have a pipe, if you will, that will transform itself into an organ or will guide the growth of an organ. How do we do that? So, uh, we don't have any, any emergency. Anything that we're gonna be working on is gonna be something that you can schedule. It's not gonna be a six months, but a patient can wait for three weeks. So we get the patients and with surgery, uh, the surgery is scheduled for a few weeks later. We get the cells from the patients. Uh, it can be bone matter derived or adipose derived. So it's sort of a mesenchymal stromal uh, population. Uh, we are still in, in, in the course of identifying, characterizi uh, characterizing the uh, population, but that's what it is. Then we get the cells, they go straight to the lab, and we expand them for around two weeks, which is a classic. You, you heard of that, it's, it's always a magic number. Those cells don't really differentiate in anything, they're just uh, expanding in number. Then we here we go, that's what we do. We have a, a scaffold. Our scaffold uh, is, is uh, an electrospun scaffold, and it's a, a polyurethane, and it's a very thin scaffold. And this is an SEM picture of what the scaffold looks like, but this is where 
we spent a few million dollars because the fiber size, the pore size, and this is what makes the difference. And the only way to actually know that is to do a large animal implant. Otherwise, you do small animals, and it all looks good, and then you do a large animal implant, and all of a sudden, it, it, it doesn't work. So you have, uh, you have a conduit there, but you don't have something that, that actually regenerates at all. We also, once we seed the scaffold, we put in a rotating bioreactor, and for three or five days, which has the uh, purpose of in an incubator, as the purpose of uh, evenly distribute the, uh, so that the scaffold acts as a perfect homing device for the stem cells. Again, this is something that we work because this makes a difference. The stem cells can either not like it at all, kind of like it, or really like the uh, microstructure. And that's the secret. If they're not that happy, is the, the, uh, we are not going to be able to start the regeneration process. At that point, this is it, this is ready. So this goes to the operating room and the surgeon does, it, does the, uh, the surgery. So I'm not gonna, but this, this is the esophagus. The only reason I guess I'm going to show this, I'm not gonna even go there. This is about 25 centimeters long. So let's say 10 inches. So when I wanna stress this, because this is an organ, this is not a small implant, we are talking about a, a, a small uh, scaffold, it could be a collagen or a polymer, and you put the cells and the cells grow. Uh, no, we're trying to really, I guess we're very ambitious, we're trying to really recreate an organ. Those are the portion, the esophagus is, is a cervical portion, a thoracic portion, and a small portion of the belly that connects to the stomach. So, what is it that we do now? Well. The surgeon gets the stomach, cuts the cancer, gets the stomach. You actually cut the stomach because the stomach looks like a, a bag. You cut it, it looks like a pipe, and you pull it in the chest and attach it uh, to the uh, remaining esophagus. Well, that doesn't sound too thrilling to me, does it? Or the other option is get a piece of colon and leave the stomach where it is, but get a piece of colon and bring it in the chest. Uh, I don't think I need to expand on it because obviously the colon, well, neither the stomach nor the colon really belong in the chest today. Uh, the problem is that uh, if you do that, you have what is called a dumping syndrome and uh, you have to be on a dietary restriction, you have nausea, diarrhea, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, and I, uh, I can keep going. What are the, uh, uh, the, uh, the issues, the complications, and the comorbidities? when you do that kind of operation. So it's a fairly large amount on, uh, of, uh, of patients, and this is very conservative, because we decided to sort of, we don't want to sort of throw a number there, but it's a thousands and thousands of patients in the US and in Europe. I'm not even going to Japan, or the, actually the in, of, uh, Asia where the incidence is higher. Uh, I just want to thank, this is one of our guys. Uh, we've been having is out of the case looking for food obviously there's no food around here but anyhow so we use a uh, Yucatan mini pig that's our large animal model and uh, that's what that's what you need to do that's what the, the to to go then into patients you just can't can do any other a small animal on so on and so forth so this is what we found um, so, this, uh, the pig that you saw before, that's it. So this is a native esophagus of that pig. And this is the one that we grew. Now again, I'm not talking about a little thing. I'm, I'm talking about a piece of esophagus, a piece of organ. This is something that tomorrow a patient could use. It's not, we're not thinking about how do we translate this, this is a good beginning, this is, no, this is, this is it, this is a real deal. Look at the submucosa, look at all the layers represented. This is a little thicker, and we have all the immunochemistry, which I can't show, otherwise I guess I'll get fired or we'll get the CSCC uh, sort of going after us. Now, you know the esophagus got muscles, right? That's what you were looking at before. Well, here are the muscles. All the layers are represented. And 
this is something that I'm not gonna lie, I can't say that I, I, I expected. This is an hour back plexus. So the, uh, you know, the innervation is parasympathetic and sympathetic. Well, we got represented it. That's what gives the, uh, the motion of the esophagus. That's what the esophagus does for a living. It contracts and it kind of pushes the food downward into the stomach. So it would be good to have something that is not a stomach or the colon, but now we have actually a new esophagus. It just, we just grew a piece of esophagus that is capable, and we had done motility tests, which is the barium swallow. So the, the, uh, the pig, usually patients do that when they're awake. The pig is slightly sedated, you do the barium swallow, you just kind of sort of shove this into, into the trough, the pig swallows, and we have, you do, a, uh, you have a, a, a C arm, so under x-ray, you do the, the uh, you see the, the barium, the moves, and we had no abnormalities. It seemed absolutely normal to me. So that's where we are, and uh, I'm just going to, I'm not going to elaborate on it. This is, again, an image what we do. You cut it, and then you put our, and for the sake of time, I'm going to stop here, but we are also working, like I alluded before, the main bronchus and on the trachea. The principle is the same, the platform is the same, only when it comes to the airways, we add onto the electrospan scaffold something else that I can't uh, apologize for that, elaborate on, but it gives you the tensile strength because when it comes to the airway, I, I, you need to be able to stay open, right? The esophagus actually usually is closed. It just opens to let the food go it, down towards the stomach, but instead the airways need to be open because air is supposed to go in and out. If that doesn't go, doesn't work, obviously the patient dies.